Ancient philosophy talked about an end of time and a, and a, a transformation of humanity. And while they could tell us about when this might occur, they really didn't underline why it would occur. Now we know why we are facing our imminent extinction on this planet and coming to those prophecies and, and making them real. And that is this. We base our world on knowledge. Knowledge is power. Lack of knowledge is lack of power. Well, the knowledge that we've been operating with for, for many centuries, in the last couple hundred years specifically, the new scientific knowledge, is not actually found to be valid today which means we've been operating from misperceptions, misbeliefs about the world comes. Well, the idea is very simply this. If, if you don't understand, the, if you have a misperception of the world, it can kill you. And so the significance, I'll give a simple example, is that if we had an anorexic person standing right here, and you and I looked at this anorexic person, we'd say, well, this person's near death, skin and bones. And we should ask them, what do they see when they look in the mirror? They say, well, I look in the mirror, I see this overweight, bloated person. And so they have a misperception. And what does the misperception lead to? It causes their brain to send chemistry to their body to reduce more weight. And because of a misperception, they're going to kill themselves. There was nothing wrong with their biology. It was their perceptions that were wrong. Well, we have three misperceptions that are causing our extinction. One is the belief that the material realm is all there is and all that matters. So that matter is all that matters. Number two is the belief that genes control our lives, which make us victims because we didn't pick the genes that can't change them and they have power over us. And the third one is an extension of Darwinian belief that says that the world is based on a struggle for survival. We all know about the rat race. So why is it a rat race? Because our fundamental belief is that if you don't go out there and fight to stay alive, you'll be trampled and killed. And so we see a world based on this Darwinian world, a nightmare of a struggle for survival, which involves war and competition and gouging each other for each one climbing up on the back of another to stay alive. So what's wrong with these perceptions? Well, number one, the belief that matters is all that matters. That's a Newtonian belief. Quantum physics has come in and said, boy, did you make a mistake on that? It's not the physical matter that's most important. It's the invisible stuff you can't see because it's the invisible fields, the energy fields that shape matter in the same way that a magnet can cause the shaping of iron filings. So if you look at the structure of what's going on in here and blame it on the structure, no, you missed it. It's based on the invisible. But the biggest part of con contribution to that invisible from us is our mind. Our minds are shaping the world. So whatever we believe is like a magnetic field that shapes our biology and our life to conform to the belief. So it says, wow, <laughs> if that's true, then all of a sudden we should put more emphasis on the mind than on the body part. And that if we change our beliefs, then we can save our world. Myth number two was that genes control us. The belief of a victim, again, cancer's in my family. What can I do about it? Might as well enjoy my life now. And all of a sudden we become irresponsible. Why? Because I said, well, if I can't control it, why do I care? And then irresponsible uh, nature leads us to, to the extinction as well. The new science says, no, genes don't control your life. Your mind controls your life. That your mind acting through a new thing called epigenetic control, a new mechanism by which the environment or the perception of the environment controls our genetics is what controls our heredity. And all of a sudden it says, well, then it means if you change your mind or your perception, then you change your biology. And the answer is, absolutely. So you're a master of your life rather than a victim. And the third one that says, get all the matter you can, take it from the earth, rape the planet, gather it all in your yard because that's a measure of your success, turns out, no, it's not. And the competition you use to gather all this matter is actually now found to be destructive because evolution is based on a cooperation. When we look into the biosphere, it's all a balanced, harmonious community except for us because our belief says it's a struggle. The plants and the animals behind me, they look at it as this is a garden for them. It's we're the only ones that are out of the garden by a misperception. Since perception controls life and misperceptions can kill you, then you recognize the fundamental misperceptions on which we base our civilization are the destructive elements leading to our extinction. And when the new beliefs come into the public, civilization will take a radical turn 
and move off into a new situation of thriving and harmony and holism. That's the dimension that we're going to. This is the end of the civilization of the old beliefs and the transition into the new one. It's really interesting when we look at the world right now, it's in crisis and that really promotes a lot of fear, which then creates a worse situation because then we get into protection, shut ourselves down. So I think we should look at what's really going on in a different understanding. Cells are like people and you have 50 trillion cells in you, so you have 50 trillion citizens, people inside of you. But imagine you were inside a caterpillar and you were in there with millions and millions of other cells and all the cells have jobs, digestion, respiration, muscle cells doing their thing. Everybody's got a job, caterpillar's growing. Everybody every day at the end of the day go, wow, man, we were working today. This thing is building, the caterpillar's getting bigger and bigger. The economy in that caterpillar's growing. So you as cells inside, you don't see the outside world, you see the inside world of, of your universe of cells as workers and all that. And you're looking around saying, yeah, system is growing, economy's great, everything's wonderful. Then there's a point where the caterpillar reaches a certain size and things start to slow down. And all of a sudden when things start to slow down, there's like more cells than necessary for the jobs. Cells start getting laid off, actually, I have what's happened. And many cells in this fear state actually commit suicide, which in biology is called apoptosis. They actually commit suicide because they look around going, oh, the thing's falling apart, everybody's losing their work, that seems like it's coming to an end. And while everybody's in that panic fear, there are other individual cells in there that are not panicked. These other cells genetically identical, but have a different vision. And they're called imaginal cells. That's the name of them. And these imaginal cells, they're in the midst of all this falling apart of their civilization, are looking and say, there's something better and more beautiful in front of us. They're the ones that create the butterfly. So from the same population that's going down with the caterpillar, many of these imaginal cells, which are the equivalent of cultural creatives, have a new vision for the civilization, saying, wait, wait, restructure this thing. We can restructure this, we can make something far better. What's happening in the world today is the end of the caterpillar. And the imaginal cells are making themselves known with new ideas, new visions, and new ways out. Because there is a far better way out. It's not the end at all. And most importantly, it's the young people have to recognize they're the population of imaginal cells because it's up to them to take what was brought into the civilization and restructure it so that they can build that butterfly civilization that is far more magnificent. So rather than looking at fear, Right now, look at this as the moment of opportunity because there's something so much better on the horizon, but we can only get there by eliminating the structure as it is now because the structure as it is now is providing for our extinction. Why is the myth perception of genes such a problem? And the answer is, if you buy that genes control you, then you buy yourself as a victim. And as soon as you buy yourself as a victim, you let go of your power in creating life. The new science of epigenetics totally reveals that this is not true and in fact uh, takes the mind and uses that as the shaper of the physical world. And the third myth, myth perception that is affecting us right now is a Darwinian belief that Evolution is based on a struggle for survival with the fittest being the winners so that what does all this lead to? It leads to a belief of materialization, that matter is all there is, and that people fight over the matter because whoever has the most matter wins according to the Darwinian theory of having the, the most and being the winner and being the fittest. Uh, and it makes a whole world based on competition. And the, the new science completely undermines that whole thing because the new science says evolution is based on cooperation. And if you don't cooperate, then the whole thing is lost. What we're seeing right now is with all the competition of each other destroying each other, wars, competing for material existence, raping the planet and tearing it apart to get some pieces of it to hold in your hands and say you won the game, every one of those moves is destructive not just of the planet but of human civilization because human civilization will thrive with cooperation and will die with competition and we're caught up in the, these three old beliefs, uh, these three old myths, as being truth. And if you operate from these truths, then you end up with the extinction that lies before us.
Nice to see you. Michael. Good to be here, Gary. This, um, I believe, calls into question Darwinian's theory of evolution. Is well, that correct? Y yes, Gary. Essentially, that theory says that human beings like us have been around for about 100,000 years. And before that, you would have had only ape-man-like creatures. Before that, apes and monkeys. Uh, what we found, however, when we looked into the entire history of archaeology, uh, my co-author and I did eight years of research. We looked at every archaeological discovery that's ever been made. And what we found is that there are hundreds of such discoveries that indicate human beings like ourselves have mm -hmm. been around for literally millions of years. We had to do eight years of research, translate papers from German, you, Russian. You, you referred to, in India, the, the Vedic literature? Well, what, yes. What that? I, I was saying uh, in the beginning that we do take uh, uh, our inspiration from these uh, ancient Sanskrit writings of India. Uh, they're collectively called the Vedas. Among them are the Puranas. Purana is a Sanskrit word. It means history. Now, these histories tell of human civilizations on this planet going back millions of years. How do, uh, we, we, know thought, those are, how do we know those are accurate? Well, that was our question, too. Uh, Richard Thompson and I, we thought, well, if, if there's any accuracy to, to those statements, there, there must be some factual evidence to back them up. Now, when we looked in the current textbooks, of course, we didn't find any such evidence, but we thought, well, let's look a little bit uh, further. And as I said, that led to an eight-year research program where we investigated every archaeological discovery ever made. And what we found is, is that, practically speaking, archaeologists and anthropologists have buried almost as much evidence as they've dug up. In other or words... Or perhaps overlooked? Um, cast aside? Well, yes, cast aside. Uh, and, and, and there have been some outright cases of... Um, of uh, suppression where people who have reported such things have had their careers ruined. We should never, I don't think, be afraid to investigate opposing points of view. This, um, this human person who looked like us, existed mm -hmm. millions of years ago, did not evolve from an ape, uh, as we are led to believe in the Darwin theory. Why has this evidence been suppressed, and what kind of evidence have you found to support this? Well, I'll give you a very good example. Now, one example from historical times is during the California Gold Rush days, miners were digging tunnels thousands of feet into the sides of mountains. Now, the, the rock in these mountains is over 10 million years old. So when they were digging these tunnels, they were finding human skeletons, they were finding stone spear points, they were finding mortars and pestles, hundreds of them at dozens of locations. Now, all these were gathered together, reported to the scientific world by J.D. Whitney, who was the state geologist of California. And he published a massive book about them uh, by Harvard University. Harvard University was the publisher. Now, what happened to these artifacts? Why aren't they on display in museums? Why aren't our children taught about them in schools? There was a very powerful anthropologist at the Smithsonian Institution named William H. Holmes. And he said to Whitney, you, Dr. Whitney, if you had understood the theory of human evolution as we understand it today, you would have hesitated to announce your conclusion, namely that human beings existed millions of years ago, despite the imposing array of facts with which you were confronted. In other words, simply because the facts didn't fit the theory, the facts had to go, and so did Professor Whitney. How, but, but back then I would imagine that they did not have the um, scientific uh, procedures to identify the exact age of, of uh, bones and matter that we have today. So can you be confident that this researcher was able to give um, a time for these bones? Yes, that found? we checked with the modern geologists about the age of the, the deposits. Mm -hmm. Now, these things continue to be discovered today, for example. And a vast amount of evidence showing that human beings like ourselves have been around for millions of years has been systematically suppressed. And I can give you some examples. For example, in 1979, Mary Leakey, who's one of the most famous archaeologists of this century, discovered in Africa completely modern human footprints, no different from the footprints that you or I would make on a beach today. Now, the thing about these footprints is they were found in rock that was dated 3.6 
million years old. And that throws out completely any idea of human origins that's current today. Why would anyone want information like that suppressed? What possible advantage would there be in that? Well, power, prestige, money, there's a lot riding on it. Uh, if any, if even one of the hundreds of cases that we document were found to be true, accepted, that would mean that everything we've been told about human origins and antiquity for the past 150 years is simply not true. And I don't think that the current establishment is ready to admit that. Uh, I think that scientists find it harder in some ways than many other people, you see, and some other people, because the, 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 there's a still a, a strong commitment even perhaps partly unconscious to the old uh, uh, atomistic worldview. So what you're saying is that science has shown us something that scientists do not want to see? Well, they've become so used to the uh, way of seeing it that they don't want to change it. You see, they feel uncomfortable about changing it, and they feel there's no reason to change it. Many of them, they say, well, we're doing so, on, so well now, why should we change it? Uh, in one sense, it looks as if we're doing very well, you see, but if you look at the broader view, it, it looks very dangerous. <laughs> in the 1840s, there was a, a, a scientific magazine called The Geologist, and it reported that in Macoupin County, Illinois, which is right here in North America, in the United States, uh, a human skeleton, just like ours, had been uncovered in a coal mine, in solid coal, 90 feet deep underneath the ground. Now, Richard Thompson and I were able to discover from the reports exactly where that occurred. And we talked to the uh, geological survey of the state of Illinois, and we asked them, well, how old is the coal there? And it turned out it was 300 million years old, which means mm -hmm. it's older than the Jurassic, you know, that word right. that everybody knows now right. that refers to the dinosaurs. In other words, it was older than the age of the dinosaurs. Wow. Okay, so that throws a whole new spin on it. Uh, yes, indeed it does. And some of uh, the uh, scientists who have read the book have obviously recognized that. For example, William Howells, who is one of the uh, big anthropologist of this century, one of the architects of the current paradigm, uh, he said, well, if, if, this, if what you say here is true, it more or less throws a monkey wrench into our whole picture of how uh, life originated on this planet. And I think it does. Something you alluded to a few moments ago I want to bring up again. Uh, you talked about man coexisting with apes and coexisting with another kind of ape-man creature. And you, again, uh, mentioned North America. And I think, of course, there's always been a lot of interest in Bigfoot, which is mm -hmm. essentially where this yes. is coming, coming from. Um, some of the information that you brought forward is that this is just a descendant of this same wild man creature that was existing years ago. That's, that's a distinct possibility. Now, when I first heard about you know, this subject, I was extremely skeptical. But what, what turned me around is when I began to read reports about these creatures by a very well-respected anthropologist. For example, Grover S. Kratz, who's at the University of Washington, you know, up in the Northwest, mm -hmm. He has extensively studied the footprints of these creatures, and he says they're biologically convincing. There is no possible way that they could have been hoaxed, and he's pretty well convinced that these creatures do exist. So that's the sort of thing that convinced me that uh, there is a very good chance that they're there, and uh, that from the descriptions of these creatures, they seem to match very well some of the descriptions that we get of the ape-man-like creatures that supposedly existed millions of years ago. Okay. So, but yet there, we keep coming around to the same thing. People just don't want to believe it. They just, like you said, well, they're skeptical. They go, oh, no, that's, that's just a hoax. They're not hearing the information that noted scientists are finding. Well, all we really wanted to do in our book is 
put the facts on the table, all of them, not, not just the facts that you will see, will see in, in the current textbooks, but all of the facts uh, that are relevant to this whole subject, and let people draw their own conclusions. One of the things that, one of the questions I first came up with when I was reading the book that you did answer in the book that I'd like you to explain was that I said, well, gee, don't we have all these machines now that can look at the footprints or the bones or whatever, and that will just tell us how old it is? Oh, this is, this is a very common perception. We have such faith in technology and those who employ it uh, that we, when we hear about things like carbon-14 testing or potassium-argon testing. You think it really is a very simple process, almost like you pop something in the microwave and right. boom, it comes out. Uh, it's not like that at all. These are very complicated procedures. Uh, what I found in practice is, is that scientists may run several tests on the same piece of bone. Some of the ages will be very great, some very small and they will tend to pick the date to publish in their scientific literature that most fits the idea that they start out with about how old the fossil should be. Mm -hmm. Now that, that often happens. What, what do scientists and researchers have to gain by distorting their findings? I mean, you would think that if they found, if they truly think that they found evidence of of man pre-existing the dates that we take for granted right now, uh, that they would want to be published, that they would want people to hear about this, that they they would get their name up in lights, as it were, um, as discuss is making this remarkable discovery. Why is this so suppressed? Well, there are, are there are tremendous pressures for uh, conformity uh, within uh, the scientific community. For example, for every academic post that opens up, every professorship that opens up in an American university, there are generally hundreds of applicants. Mm -hmm. And it does not help your reputation if you go reporting things that should not uh, be reported. It could be very bad for one's reputation. And in our book, we, we document several cases of that. Uh, for example, uh, Virginia Steen McIntyre. She's a, a geologist who I personally know. She lives in Colorado now. Uh, she went to Mexico in the 1970s, and she was a geologist with the U.S. Geological Survey. She dated a site there where some uh, human artifacts have been found at 300,000 years. Mm -hmm. all, all her test results show that that was the age of that site. Uh, but because that went against the dominant idea that uh, human beings have only been in North America for, for 30,000 years, uh, she said she was not able to get the report published. Uh, uh, she was uh, labeled a publicity seeker and a maverick. In, um, in her community of scholars, and she said she eventually lost a professorship that she held at an American university uh, because of this and hasn't been able to work as a geologist since. Now, this is not the, the normal picture that we have of how science works, but uh, unfortunately, these are the sorts of things that can happen, and these are the sorts of uh, pressures that can be applied uh, in order to keep a certain view intact. Mm -hmm. so, so what do people need to do now? They, they apparently, we need the public to open their minds up a little bit more to alternative ideas to what we've yes. been taught. Well, I think one thing we need to do is uh, develop a little bit more of a healthy skepticism towards pronouncements from spokespersons from the scientific community. Uh, just as we've learned uh, not to accept without question every pronouncement that may come from you know, the press secretary of a politician or uh, the, the uh, public relations office of a corporation. Uh, we may want to dig a little further, keep an open mind, have some healthy skepticism, and I think uh, perhaps uh, we've placed spokespersons from the scientific community on a little bit of a pedestal, uh, and we may need to give them this, the same uh, sort of uh, uh, treatment that we would give to spokespersons from other 
other uh, groups in society. And let's just put the facts on the table and, and, and look at them and see how they've been dealt with. It shouldn't matter, you know, what your motive is. It's like bowling. If you bowl a strike, who cares if you're doing it for uh, this reason or another? I mean, facts are facts. Now, the facts that well, we've uncovered... Well, we know statistics... Right. Uh, uh, can be uh, distorted uh, for whichever oh. way someone wants them to be distorted. We know that. Right. The, you, you and I could take the same statistic and change it around and make it look different. So let's look at them. Uh, you have talked in terms of the uh, fact that scientists don't cheat. That's a myth. You say there's actual cheating going on. Oh, that's very well documented. For example, the, the Piltdown case is a very famous case that documents that. Now, what that has to do with is early in this century, uh, there was a purported discovery of an ape man in England uh, based on a skull and a jawbone. And this Piltdown man, Piltdown ape man, was in the science textbooks for about 40 years. And then uh, suddenly it was revealed that the British Museum had tested these fossils and determined that it was a very elaborate hoax. And many people have speculated about the identity of the person who was the hoaxer, and practically all of them center on different scientists in England, such as Sir Grafton Elliot Smith or Sir Arthur Smith Woodward, uh, all very well-established scientist in England because only somebody who, who knew the scientific ver method very well could have prepared these fossils in such a way that they would have fooled the scientific community all around the world for 40 or 50 years. So some scientist who wanted to perhaps give some evidence in favor of evolution, because there's not very much of it, uh, invented this ape man and in a very sophisticated way, uh, cheated, literally. And this is admitted by the scientists themselves. And there are more examples I could give. Evidence that goes against human elevation, or evolution is reported only by crackpots. Now this, this is one of the standard techniques that the scientific community tries to use against anybody that reports something that goes against their ideas. Uh, they try to label them in a derogatory way without actually discussing the facts. And I think we've all had experience of that. Um, but uh, the real facts are is that actual scientists have over the past 150 years reported many astounding facts that go against the theory of evolution. And the present scientific community doesn't want people to know that. They want, they want to promote the idea that anybody that's against evolution is somehow or other a, a religious fanatic, a crackpot, uh, but it's simply not true. And I've, I've, had, I've personally met a scientist who have uh, discovered some of these things, and what happens to them is it's, it's, uh, it's very unfair, the treatment to which they are subjected. We're going to go to Anton in Brookfield, Wisconsin. Anton, how are you? Fine, thank you. Your comment. I've often uh, wondered how the perfect complementary uh, male-female systems of reproduction could have evolved from unintelligent life forms. You know, Anton, not only is that a good question, but also the point is if, if evolution occurred, it'd have to be simultaneous evolution of both species at the same time. Because if it took a million years uh, for the female to evolve, uh, it would have kind of messed up the, the whole procreation thing, wouldn't it? Right. That's my question. A good Thanks. question. Uh, stay right there. Michael Cremo, your response. Well, I would like to put together a book called Darwin's Fairy Tales. <laughs> and I think that would be one of them. You, you can just look at so many examples of complex structures and behaviors in uh, different creatures, whether it's the, the how, how the spider learned to spin its web, 
or how our uh, human uh, reproduction system came about or any of these things. They're a complete mystery. They're not explained even theoretically uh, by the evolutionist and they're what they do is when they want to explain anything they just wave their magic wand and said it happened by evolution and that's why i call it darwin's fairy tales if you were to predict what archaeologists might find uh, you would say well they would tend to find a very bewildering mixture of anatomically modern human fossils ape man-like fossils uh, a crude stone tools, uh, articles uh, indicative of a higher level, higher level of culture, all sort of mixed up and going back, you know, hundreds of millions of years. Mm -hmm. I think you might also predict that given the uh, biases of investigators towards a linear progressive idea of time with things beginning in a very simple state and progressing in a linear fashion to a more advanced state uh, that they might edit mm -hmm. that record mm -hmm. to conform to their linear progressive biases mm -hmm. and indeed uh, both predictions we found in our investigations do come true. You actually do have that very bewildering, you know, mixture of uh, advanced artifacts and bones mixed up with more primitive ones mm -hmm. going back hundreds of millions of years. Mm -hmm. And you also uh, do find a very systematic editing of this record to conform to a linear, progressive, you might call it evolutionary, view of things, which is quite amazing. Mm -hmm. Of course, if, if we have this sort of cyclical, cyclical picture, circular yeah. picture of, of things, uh, much of uh, conventional science will need to be readjusted. There's a still a strong commitment, even perhaps partly unconscious, to the old uh, atomistic worldview. So what you're saying is that science has shown us something that scientists do not want to see it. Well, they become so used to the uh, way of seeing it that they don't want to change it. You see, they feel uncomfortable about changing it, and they feel there's no reason to change it. Many of them, they say, well, we're doing so, on, so well now, why should we change it? Uh, in one sense, it looks as if we're doing very well, you see, but if you look at the broader view, it, it looks very dangerous. <laughs> now, many people are talking about this new worldview that's coming up these years. Do you see a new worldview coming up in the Western world? Well, in a certain part of the Western world, yes. Uh, I think uh, a worldview in which uh, is, there's uh, more focus on wholeness, on process, rather than on analysis into parts and more static uh, uh, constituents. But does that come up because we want it or because we are forced to take on it? Well, uh, probably both. I mean, that is, I think a certain fraction of the uh, people want it. Perhaps they're tired of the old one. They don't feel it's working. <laughs> and also there is some evidence for it, I think, especially in physics and probably in other sciences as well. Uh, the evidence in physics comes partly from relativity and partly from quantum theory or perhaps more, more from quantum theory than relativity. Uh, this, um, uh, again, all of these, you see, combine to the notion that the universe is a kind of indivisible whole rather than analyzed into constituent elements which interact uh, as uh, separately existent. So the classical level, Newtonian level, uh, is explained by quantum mechanics as a limiting case, you see. Of a, of a more, so that it, it, you have a whole, a whole, but the whole determines itself to behave uh, somewhat like independent parts in many cases. <laughs> so even whether it's going to be in, uh, uh, behaving like parts is determined by the whole, right? But what we can see is the parts rather than Well, the whole. we see, in physics, we see the parts because that's the way we uh, approached them in the last few centuries. 
I don't know if, you see, I think our perception is uh, influenced by our way of thinking so that we accept this mechanical way of looking at things. But if you went back a thousand or two thousand years, I don't think people actually saw the parts as primary. <laughs> the way we see it depends on the way we think, you see. <laughs> we actually make up everything in the sense all these theories are made up by us, but in these theories we place the parts, uh, we may either place the parts as fundamental or the whole as fundamental. Right? Now, the quantum mechanics is placing the whole as fundamental. That's, I think, the most basic uh, change it makes, right? Uh, finally, every theory is made up by us, and we are going to see whether we can apply it coherently <laughs> to reality. You see that I think we could make an infinity of different kinds of theories, and uh, some of them would be more coherent than others. You see, for example, if somebody is said to be mentally disturbed, he has another theory which we think is incoherent, but to him it looks coherent, right? <laughs> because we can all... We can always ignore what is not working, you see. <laughs> or was, we can always say we'll solve that later. Hmm. You just said that, that in reality we make it all up, not just the parts yeah. but also the holes. Could you explain? I think, well, I think that that's the question. What is the relationship of theory to reality, you see? Now, one view is that it reflects reality, you see. Now, that I think uh, that it uh, corresponds to reality. I think that view is only limited, right? Like a map is said to correspond to a city, but there's no nothing on the map that corresponds to anything in the city. I, in the map, you see dots of print, and the city, which is very vaguely defined, the city is also vaguely defined. So what corresponds is certain abstractions that we abstract. Hmm. Right? We're, but the map, the real the test of the map is that it guides us correctly in the city. And if it's a wrong map, we will find incoherence right, in our action. Right? Now, uh, you see, so, uh, therefore, we make it all up, but the question is, uh, how coherent does it, is it when we try to make it work? You see, that's, that's really the, the key. Some, now, some theories are more coherent than others, but it's often hard to tell because when we come to a theory as broad as a worldview, we find it very hard to detect incoherence because the worldview tends to state that things that don't fit are irrelevant or else says they're going to make, we're going to get them in order later. We, we haven't solved that problem yet. <laughs> so incoherence can easily be not noticed. <laughs> uh, but uh, if people are very, and also people would like not to have their worldviews questioned and for, because they have got used to them and feel comfortable with them. So uh, therefore it's very hard to question a worldview. But in effect, that's what you are doing. Yeah. And in effect, in effect, you are questioning the whole Western worldview. Yes. Well. Uh, yes, I, I think even the, uh, all the worldviews need to be questioned. The Eastern and the Western. See, the West has, in a sense, implicitly questioned the Eastern worldview. <laughs> uh, every worldview, I think, is limited. But I think the Western worldview, its limits have not been seen. And uh, we need to go to a broader view, not necessarily back to the Eastern, though it may include some of the Eastern. Uh, but I think we need a kind of dialogue of these worldviews <laughs> to go to something beyond. Right? Where do you see the limits of the Western worldview? Well, just in the way of saying that, 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 uh, that it, it focuses too much on analysis and it tends to lead to fragmentation, you see. Now, what I mean by fragmentation is not just division, distinction, but because the par parts in the whole are correlative concepts, you see, a part is a part only because it's part of a whole, like a machine or a watch. Right? Now, a fragment is something you, it means break it up, you see, that's the root of the word, to smash. Right? So if you smashed a watch, you would get fragments. Now, now the Western view, it aims at getting the true parts of the universe, but in some ways, perhaps it gets fragments, in the, not uh, to some extent in physics, but much more so in fields like biology, psychology, so, so, sociology, <laughs> and so on. Right? But a tenor, now, if you break it up falsely into fragments, then you have the confused. You see, you're going to treat these as separate when they're not, and also you're going to unite what's in the fragment when it's not united, right? So it leads to confusion. So in the West, the, you, you tend to confuse the part for the whole and vice versa? Yeah, you get confused about the part and the whole because you take a fragment as an independent whole. But if you take the, the, the true whole that, that includes everything, it would also include you and include mm -hmm. your perception of the whole. Yes. 
So could you ever tell me your, your way of perceiving the whole to anyone else? Well, we can have a dialogue and, we're, and so begin to exchange, you see. Uh, in other words, I can't tell you unless we're talking together. You see, we, <laughs> we, we have to exchange our views on that, right? And perhaps uh, now... Uh, and then there comes the problem that people are ready to listen to somebody else's worldview, you see, seriously. <laughs> without sure. resistance, you know, without opposition. But, but I think uh, the, the observer is an intrinsic part of the whole. That, that's what quantum mechanics is teaching us, too, in physics, right? That the, obser that the observing instrument is just as much part of the whole, and therefore, because of the, the possibility of these non-local interactions in quantum mechanics, when an observation is made, the two systems are not really distinct, you see. Therefore, they participate in each other, and you cannot therefore get an unambiguous uh, meaning to the measurement, right? The same happens between human beings, you see, that if somebody tries to measure somebody else, talk to him, there's a mutual change which makes it impossible to get an unambiguous uh, uh, attribution of qualities. It's not possible to, to say what David Bohm would have said in another interview no. tomorrow at the same time. No, because you're, we're participating together, so what I am is affected by what you're doing and what you are, and vice versa, right? That's exactly the sort of thing that happens in quantum mechanical observations. Okay, if I say then that when I think about the whole and the part, I end up understanding that if you understand the whole, you're not able to tell it to anyone else because because then you step out of the hole and become a part. Well, you c I think there's a kind of communication. See, this is the point about having a different worldview. There is a kind of communication that does not begin by denying wholeness, you see. You see, if we say, here am I and here are you, and uh, then we have already divided it, right? But perhaps we could communicate in the spirit of the whole without assuming that division, right? We're not trying to tell, that means I'm not trying to tell you what I think, or you not trying to tell me, but rather together we are trying to discover how we're going to think together. Do you see the difference? So you eventually became a biologist. What did you actually learn then? Well, it was interesting because uh, I became a, um, a, a biologist, a developmental cellular biologist. I'm working on cells, of course. And uh, in my, my graduate work, I was cloning stem cells. And it's interesting because a lot of people think stem cells are something brand new that just came into this world recently. And the fact was, I was cloning stem cells back in 1967, 40 years ago. And the significance was, while I was doing this research, I was also teaching medical students. So I was teaching medical students the foundation of how cells work, the conventional story out of the textbook, genes control life, what we call the genetic determinism, the belief that genes control your traits, behavior, your physical characteristics, etc. And what my research revealed when I was studying the stem cells was this, very profound. I put one stem cell in a petri dish all by itself and it would divide every 10 to 12 hours. So it'd be two, four, eight, 16 cells, 32 cells. After about two weeks, I have thousands of cells in the Petri dish, but what was unique? They were all genetically identical. But then I did the experiment. The experiment was to take some cells out of the dish and put them into a separate dish with a different environment. Okay. And so the environment is a culture medium, but the culture medium to cells is like the world that we live in. It's got the air, the water, the food, all the things in it. So I take the cells out of my stem cell dish, put them in a separate dish with a, a different environment and the cells form muscle. But then I went back to the same dish with genetically identical cells in it and took some cells out and put them in a different environment and they form bone. And then I went back to the same dish with genetically identical cells and put them in a third petri dish with a different environment and they form fat cells. And there I was confronted with this reality. All the cells are genetically identical but they had different fate, fat, muscle, bone. And I say, Simple question, what controls the fate of cells? And the answer is the environment. It was the only thing that was different because they were all genetically identical. So I started to really say, oh my goodness, here I am teaching genes control life to the medical students. 
And yet the cells were revealing to me that, hey, they all had the same genes, but it was the environment that I put them in. And so the environment controlled their life. And a very simple experiment that is very profound for us today is if I took my dish with plastic Petri dish with cells in it and moved it from a healthy environment to a less than healthy environment, the cells get sick. And if I were a doctor of cells, I, you might say, well, what kind of drugs would you give these cells? And it turns out, no, you don't give the cells any drugs. You just take the dish from the bad environment, put it back into a good environment, and the cells will innately, naturally come back to health again. So how did this realization impact you at the time? Because you, you were teaching something completely different. Yes. You did this experiment, and you realized what you were teaching wasn't the full truth. Oh, absolutely. And, and then I had a problem with my colleagues, because first of all, they doubted my work, and then I brought them into the experiments. And I had them observe them, watch them, and they all said, wow, yeah, the environment controls the cells. Uh, but they wanted to marginalize it, so they would say, oh, that's an exception or an anomaly, because we're teaching genetic control. It didn't fit the story. The net result, what it led me to do was, I had tenure. I had tenure at the university. I walked out of the university and said, look, I, I can't keep my integrity. And at the same time, teach something I know was patently wrong. Uh, so I walked out because I saw that teaching the belief that genes control life was very, very incorrect. And uh, it's very interesting because I did that in 1970. Now that's like 30, uh, 40 years ago. And guess what? The new science that is just coming into the forefront of our world today is, is something called epigenetic control. What I was teaching was genetic control, control by genes. The new science, which is now coming around, is called epigenetic control. And what that means, in the, you understand the prefix epi means above. So you say epidermis, that means the layer above the dermis skin. If I say epigenetic control, literally it says control above the genes. And this is the new science, and why is it profound? Because when you teach genetic control, you teach victimization. You didn't pick the genes as far as we know. The genes control your traits. You can't change the genes, so uh, you become victimized by your heredity. Uh, and the new science, epigenetic control, reveals how your response to the environment uh, as you change your response to the environment, you change the fate of your cells, just like in the Petri dish. Uh, uh, and that makes you a master, because you are the one that has the opportunity to change your perception and response, so therefore you're the one that controls your genes. But it took you some time, didn't it, to actually incorporate that in your life, because I know in the Biology of Belief, your book, you talk about you went through a very unhappy period, yes. your father was dying of cancer, you had a very messy divorce from your first wife, and you weren't happy, and you thought at that point that actually your genes did influence, and you had unhappy genes, and it took you some time to actually realize that in your life, you could change things. Yeah, it was very interesting because, again, I was still coming from the programs of my own deep beliefs, which I got from childhood on, uh, about genetic control. And yet, it was funny because I was at that point also going out and beginning to talk to people about this new science, about if you understand what I'm talking about, you can create this fabulous life. And it was fun because in the beginning, I would try to get people together and I'd tell them, you can create this fabulous life. And they'd sit at me and look and go, you know, Lipton, for a guy who says you, you can create a life, with, with this stuff, your life doesn't look that good. And, and, and essentially, I almost said, fortunately, I didn't say the words, but I essentially said, well, do as I say, not as I do. And that was the opening point that said, oh my God, I can't just talk about the academics of the new science. To make it work, you actually have to apply the principles of the new science. And that was a change point in my life where I said, well, I'm not going to lecture on this unless I verify to myself that by influencing my personal beliefs and attitudes and things that I can change my biology. And it was wonderful because it only took just a short time to realize how I manifest profound changes in my life by taking in the understanding that how I see the world, my perceptions, uh, control not just my internal biology and my genetics and behavior, but it controls how I create in the world around me. So I went from a world of almost self-destruction into this world of more mastery 
And, and the most exciting thing is I found since that time that I, ab I absolutely live in heaven because I've created but, a but life. Let, let, let's look at practically how you did that, just so people pick up a few clues. Okay, well the first thing is this. The, the work showed that your mind's perception of the world changes your biology, the chemistry of your body, uh, which changes your cells. And I said, okay, so if you control how your mind operates, then you can control your chemistry. But then here's where the problem comes from. There's two parts to the mind. The conscious mind, which has your personal identity, your spirit, your source attached with it, is a creative mind. The conscious mind can see into the future, can review the past, solve problems. The subconscious mind, the other mind, is more of a habit mind. That's when you learn how to do something, and once you learn how to do it, you don't have to think about it, it's automatic. Well, most of us walk around in the world thinking that we're running our lives with our creative mind. And I'd say, Emmett, what do you want out of your life? And you would say, oh, I want to uh, be healthy, I want to have great relationships, and, and then you try to say, I'm running my life with these beliefs. But science has now revealed that we only run our lives with our conscious mind at most about 5% of the time. So we're running on these subconscious programs. 95% yeah. of the time. Okay. And then the issue is, well, where'd you get the fundamental programs that you yeah. operate from? And here's the, the thing I learned is that it's in the first six years of our lives that the brain is in a functional state, an EEG state, the electrical activity, that is not even in consciousness. A child doesn't even reach conscious brain function until about six. So the first six years of your life, your brain function is lower frequency. It's called theta which is like a hypnogogic trance, a hypnosis. So the first six years of your life, you're like a television camera recording everything around you, everything you observe, just going in from your uh, observations into your programming. So we acquire beliefs and attitudes and behaviors, not from ourselves, but from our parents and our family and our community. These become the fundamental beliefs. Uh, a very interesting point. Uh, the Jesuits had, were very proud. They would say, give me a child until it's six or seven and it will belong to the church for the rest of its life. What they were saying was what they knew, which science is now finding out, the first six years are programming. Yes. And whatever program you get, that will be the rest of your life. So that's why they said, just give me the first six years. And it turns out they were precise. The, the first six years is download a program and that's when you get your behaviors from those around you. So you were able, by realizing this, to then look at how you were living your life on a practical level and say, I am not going to be governed by these pre-programs. I am going to live my life in a more conscious way. Am, am I oversimplifying well, this? Yeah, it, 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 that's a, a fundamental statement of how it works, but it's not as easy no, as, oh, okay, that. I've just yeah. changed my thinking about yeah. it. It's like, yeah. well, because as w the, the thinking is not that much in our control. The brain is operating, as I said, 95% from the yes. subconscious. Uh, but, uh, but, but how did you actually then get results in a, f a relatively short space of time? Well, the, the first thing, how does the subconscious learn? And that's a very critical thing. Uh, the conscious mind can learn from reading a book. So you, the subconscious can, mind can read a self-help book and you go, wow, that sounds really great. And then you find you read the book but your life is still the same. And it turns out, why? And the answer is because the subconscious mind is more of a habit mind. Things that you repeat over and over again. Yes. So yeah. the reality is, if you can stay conscious, be present, and when those negative thoughts come in our head, and, and psychologists tell us 70% of the time, the thoughts that are going through our head are negative and redundant. So the same negative thoughts are going through. If you could stop those thoughts, if you could hear them as they come through, like, oh, that's not going to work, or this will never happen, those yeah. kinds of thoughts. If you can hear them and stop them consciously, say, no, uh, uh, change the belief right there. Just give the more positive thing. As you repeat this more frequently and you keep repeating it, the subconscious mind begins to learn. So as a habit, if okay. you stay conscious and you have to work at it, and, and here's why people say, well, how come only 5% from conscious mind, 95% for, from subconscious? Because the conscious mind can think into the future and think into the past and solve problems, then think about it yourself. Most of the time, you're thinking about something. Well, if you're thinking, you're using the conscious mind. Well, if you're using the conscious mind for thinking, then who's running the show? And the answer is, when you're not paying attention and you're thinking about what I'm gonna do tomorrow, your subconscious is running. So you use the words, be present. Be present. 
which be we, mindful. we hear a lot. So be mindful, which really means be aware yes. of what's going on. What, so you get an automatic reaction, you're aware of that, and you say, I don't want to go there, that's an old pattern, and you look at a new way to be in that situation. Exactly, and okay. you have to repeat it over and over again, yeah. because if you think, well, I, I, I got mad at myself yesterday because I repeated that same stupid thing, and I got mad again today because I repeated the same stupid thing, and then people give up because they get frustrated, and it's like, no, no, it's a habit. So you have to every day, but ultimately, you can repeat it, yet there are, fortunately now very many new healing modalities that uh, that can help you rewrite the subconscious beliefs much faster so uh, I get very excited because uh, some of this may take work for people because you have to really be present and yet we're so bombarded with information and our lives are so busy that our conscious mind is almost always wandering trying to resolve issues and problems and things we have to work out which then means the subconscious mind is running the show yeah. Uh, and it's very interesting because most people will be very familiar with this story. I tell it to my audiences and they all laugh because they're familiar with it. I say, look, you have a very close friend. You know your friend's behavior. And you happen to know your friend's parent. And at some point you see that your friend shares the same behavior as their parent. So, you, you know, you casually volunteer. You go, you know, Bill, you're just like your dad. And that's when you have to back away from Bill, <laughs> uh, because Bill's the first guy that says, how can you compare me to my dad? And everyone laughs because they're familiar, uh, but I say, uh, no, there's two very profound points from that one story, and profound point number one. Everybody else can see that Bill behaves like his dad. He got his programming from his dad. It's only Bill who doesn't see it. Yeah. And profound point number two, we're all Bill, because all of us got programming and all of us operate with these programs and we don't even see we're doing it that we even when told we're doing it will deny that we do these behaviors because we don't even see what we're doing that's why it's called subconscious below conscious because you went from and I'm quoting from your book wanting to be anyone but me yes to being I think you quote yourself as the happiest man in the world you felt so happy oh so my you gosh. prove that this can work well, I had to because I said when I first started talking about it, it was from an academic conscious point of view. This is what I learned. But my subconscious programs are still exactly the same. So, yeah. well, I had this wonderful knowledge. My life still wasn't anything I wanted to, to brag about it because it wasn't. And, uh, and as you know, that old game, well, who would you like to be? And I could think of anybody I'd rather be than me. And yet, when I started to apply the new science and rewrite the subconscious so it supported me rather than the programs of limitation or disempowerment that we get from our parents and our community as children, which almost all of us get, when I put in the new programs, all of a sudden I started to find, my goodness, my life completely turned around. Uh, all wonderful things started happening in my life. I was healthier. I haven't been to a doctor in 20 years. I, I, I don't need that. I don't take any of their drugs. Why? Because most of the illness is just from the stress of not living in harmony. Mm -hmm. And when you learn to, to get rid of the limiting programs that we got as children and put in programs that support you, guess what? Then all of a sudden, the place turns into heaven. Uh, and it's interesting, people, I tell people, well, you create your own life, and then they look around and go, oh, I don't want responsibility for this. But I say, well, you didn't know you were creating with these unconscious beliefs.